So we're going to hit uh, just kind of one topic, and I wanted to dive into uh, something that um, this guy Rob Henderson um, mentioned. So Rob is a kind of a he's got a fascinating story. He's he grew up kind of a, as a foster kid, uh, and he he um, is just a brilliant has a brilliant mind and has been writing uh, uh, really from the perspective of the working class about a lot of issues, and probably his claim to fame. Uh, more than anything else, is really coining and describing the impact of what he calls luxury beliefs uh, on on society. So, luxury belief is something that somebody a belief that gives you status, but that you could only really live out or hold if you are in a position of economic privilege. <laughs> so, uh, there's lots of examples he gives. He lists tons of them. Things like you know, defund the police. You know, <laughs> like that works great if you live in a gated community, you know, not so good if you live in a really crime ridden area. Um, so you can say that all day long because you're not incurring any of the costs, but you are getting status <laughs> by saying that within a certain community. Another one is a lot of positions that were related to climate change. I mean, it's really easy to talk about, you know, hey, we're going to, uh, we should all pay more for energy. <laughs> That's great if you're not in a you know, impoverished country, <laughs> you know? Um, so this is not being called out properly, that there are beliefs that give you a lot of status, but they also, you're not incurring the cost. You're actually exporting the cost on vulnerable people. Um, and and so, and what, what's really interesting to me about Rob Henderson's position is he's really begun to talk about this from the perspective of the family. As a kid who grew up, you know, in a, in a single parent household and then ended up in foster care, uh, he's very concerned about about popular beliefs that are really hard on the family. I mean, he talks a lot about you know any kinds of beliefs like we should have alternative lifestyles. We don't really need nuclear. The nuclear moms and dads aren't important. He's like, yeah, that that works really good if you are in a position of the top you know one percent of privilege. Then maybe you can make that work. You have all you use all this money and all this privilege and your your huge network to be able to defend your, you know, your, uh, alternative lifestyle, but for somebody who's barely surviving, um, to say being a single parent is just as good as being in a two parent home. That is a terrible idea for 90% of the world. Um, and they're not getting status from your belief, but your policies that are creating the situation potentially for more people that can't incur the cost. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, he's, he's really stirring up that conversation. And, uh, he was on a podcast called unheard where he was describing one of these situations with regards to technology that really uh, stood out to me. So I'm going to play this uh, little clip for you guys, and then we'll love to get your, your feedback. There was a, an op-ed in the New York Times written a little over a year ago, and the headline was something like, you know, I make video games, but I won't let my daughters play them. And he, like, very, he was very honest. I mean, it was a very uh, blunt op-ed where he was like, we want you to be addicted to the games because, like, that's how we make money. <laughs> like, it's not that hard to understand, to, to connect the dots. But then he's, like, you know, talking about how he's he's worried that, his, you know, his daughters would, would get addicted to it and so he doesn't let them play. But I cited this, uh, this study uh, recently indicating that um, children raised in families that earn $35,000 or less per year spend two hours more per day on screens than children raised in families that earn $100,000 or more per year. So essentially, kids in poor families spend two hours more per day in front of a screen than kids from rich families. And a lot of that has to do, I think, you know, interestingly, that is connected to the, the family issue, where if you are a single parent and you work all day and your attention and resources are spread very thin and then you get home and your kid is disruptive or rowdy or something, it's just so much easier to just give them an iPhone or an iPad and just say, hey, go chill out and they can be distracted and kind of, um, you know, soothed for a while while you can, you know, kind of have mm -hmm. some peace and quiet. But if you have two parents, you know, you can you can actually monitor a disruptive kid and find more constructive and engaging ways to take up their time. All right. So that, that's his position. And I wanted to maybe get your, your guys' feedback on this. So I think I think one of the problems that I'm really wrestling with here is that when we talk to family teams, we're often talking to, you know, intact families and we're trying to help level up families that where there's a mom and a dad. But what's, you know, the vast majority of people are living in a world with broken families where they don't have a lot of those advantages. And so part of what I don't know what to do with, and I want to get your guys' take, I just want to have a discussion about this. So I, I really don't know how to think about this. 
So the is um, regulating technology a family problem or a societal problem? That's the question I'm trying to wrestle with. I definitely prefer to think of it as a family problem in my context because I have the bandwidth to enforce on my family um, the the kinds of sort of technology restrictions that my family will will help my family to thrive. But it requires enormous amounts of work. I mean, I have contracts with my kids and, you know, I monitor the devices and I'm, I'm locking them down. And, and so we're in a position of just radical privilege, so to speak, from a, just um, a bandwidth perspective. We, we care a lot about this issue. We've thought a lot about it. We've read the books. We've, you know, read the articles and we're intentional about how to limit our children's, um, the impact that social media is having my daughters, for example, or, that the and, and I would say that even in that context, there's a lot of times in which we've really failed our kids. I mean, there's there's a whole world of of challenges I think our families faced, and we just were too slow or too ignorant or too passive <laughs> to fight this monster. Uh, and and so I definitely don't want to paint the picture that we've done everything right. Like we're constantly learning, and we've made a lot of mistakes as well. Okay, but that's that's one frame. There's another frame that. Rob Henderson is bringing up that I don't think about nearly enough. And this is the one I wanted to ask you guys about. What about, what about everyone else? I mean, you've got companies that are spending billions of dollars to get children addicted to, to things that are going to grab their attention and make these different platforms, a huge amount of money. And wow, that is not a, that's not a fair fight. I mean, I don't feel like it's a fair fight in my context. And so I don't know what to do about this, but this is kind of the, I want to stir up this conversation and say, you know, as fathers, do we have two obligations? Do we have an obligation on one hand to be leading our families to make sure that we have policies in place within our households that are protecting our children from this vulnerability? But do we also have the obligation to think about this at a societal level, given the fact the vast majority of children are being exposed to the these sort of predatory technologies in a way where the, the parents or the single parent in whichever case, you know, they, they just don't have the bandwidth to really properly monitor what's going on. And, and so these kids are getting addicted in ways that are destroying all of us, right. And destroying another generation of children. 